Well, we're glad you joined us at the 8.30 service this morning. So you remembered to set your clocks ahead or your cell phone got you up. And so we, you know, years ago, we didn't have the cell phones that did it automatically for us. You had to do it all manually. And so sometimes people would oversleep or just forget to do it. I had a preacher friend about five years ago. It was down in Lexington, Kentucky. They had two services, one at 8.30 and one at 11 o'clock. And he took his family out of town on Saturday to a birthday party of a family member came back, went to bed, never thought a thing about setting their clocks ahead. And while he was in the bathroom showering and shaving, he got a text from one of their staff members and said, where are you? And he said, well, I'll be there, you know, in plenty of time. They go, no, you're supposed to preach in two minutes. You need to be here. And he missed it. I've always had the fear that, especially on time change Sunday, I would forget to set a clock ahead or not pay any attention and oversleep and not show up. And my fear is nobody noticed or cared if I did. So we're glad you made it this morning, especially at the early service. Tess Brigham is a licensed psychotherapist and a life coach in San Francisco, and she specializes in treating those in the millennial generation. She said it wasn't her decision to treat those in the millennial generation of the 20s to four, early 40s. She said they just automatically started flocking to her practice. And she said, 90% of my patients are between the ages of 23 and 38, and then the rest are usually parents of millennials. And over the last few years of her practice, she said she's noticed a dominant theme that comes to a cluster of problems about which millennials come seeking help from her, and it is this. They say, I have too many choices, and I can't decide what to do. What if I make the wrong choice? Brigham indicates that her studies show that the biggest struggle for most millennials is decision fatigue. She shares that those in their 20s and 30s have many questions. What did I want? What do I want out of life? What am I great at? How can I make a meaningful contribution? In his book, The Paradox of Choice, Barry Schwartz writes about those decades of when a person is in their 20s and 30s. He says, learning to choose is hard. Learning to choose well is harder. And learning to choose well in a world of unlimited possibilities is harder still, perhaps too hard. You know, when somebody's in their 20s and 30s, often the opportunities abound and options can look almost unlimited. It is an exciting time of life when you're in your 20s and 30s. Formal education is being completed, a career path is being established, a significant relationship is being developed, independence from one's parents is being realized, your own family unit is being formed. It's usually the experience of the first full-time paid job, the birth of a first child, the establishment of one's own household, the initial thrill of responsibility on your own. Now, today I'm speaking primarily about the generation of those from about the age of 20 to the age of 40 as we continue this sermon series, Generation to Generation. And this is the Millennials' generation. The Millennials are often called the Gen Y generation as well. They grew up during the era when everybody got a trophy simply for being. You didn't have to win anything, you just had to be, and you got recognized by some kind of accolade. Now, that age range of 20 to 40 can vary a little bit, but I'm going to focus today mostly on those who were born between 1980 through the year 2000. And the millennial population makes up about 25% of our nation's total population. Within our own congregation, those members and attendees, which we have birth dates in our database, our congregation is made up of about 16% of millennials. But when you factor in their children, their households make up just over 25% of our congregation. Now, if you are between the ages 20 to 40, would you stand? I know we've got some here this morning. I know it's a little bit earlier, but we got some here this morning. All right, there you go. Welcome these folks. We're glad they're here. Thank you for being here. We're on this third sermon in a five-part series. We, we talked about, two weeks ago, children. Last week, we talked about teenagers. And today, we're talking about the excitement of young adulthood. And then in the next two Sundays, we're going to look at what's often called the baby boomers, which is next week, and then the following week, the silent generation. But the theme verse for this whole series has been Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. 
Now, this Gen Y group has been called the minivan zone. That means you probably have at least one car seat in each of your vehicles. Your vehicles probably have cracker crumbs and smashed french fries inside of them. There are snack wrappers and papers from school inside your van. If you're in this group, sometimes the best part of your day is when your youngest child has finally fallen asleep. Or you might be in this group if uh, you've seen every animated release in the past couple of years, but you can't remember finishing a single movie or book on your own. Now, for this season of life, it's often about pursuing. You're enhancing your vocation. You're establishing some life goals. You're maneuvering a family. You're forging a lifestyle. So I want us to look this morning at some principles from Scripture that will hopefully provide guidance through this two-decade period of life of the 20s and the 30s. Here's the first principle. Be alert to the temptations life can bring. Be alert to the temptations life can bring. Now, every phase of life can bring with it certain temptations. Children can learn to be selfish. Teenagers can struggle with purity. The middle age can battle apathy. Those who are older can be tempted to complain or become spiritually passive. Now, there's a passage I want to look at and find it in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is teaching, and someone asked him, said, Lord, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. And Jesus elaborated a very specific warning that addresses at least two of the temptations that we often face when we're in our 20s and our 30s. It's in Luke 12, beginning at verse 15. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but he is not rich toward God. Now, one of the first temptations with which young adults might struggle is pride. See, the man in Jesus' story referred to himself a lot. In fact, at least seven different times, this man talks about himself and what he's going to do through his accomplishments. When one has either completed the college or secured a job in a field you desire, there is that feeling of accomplishment because you've invested a lot of time in your education or some kind of preparation for a path that will ideally put you in a position to be independent from your parents, to supply your basic needs. You're probably beginning to set up your own household. But in the midst of that excitement of accomplishment, one's ego can begin to enlarge. You begin to feel successful, and if not cautious, you can begin stepping on others to even advance yourself. There are some people who are born with a lot of talent, and you simply need to allow God to open those doors for you. But there's another direction that pride can take, and that is discontentment. I think those in their 20s and 30s, if not careful, can become very discontented about their life because you see people who are doing much better than you are. And that temptation is to begin to wonder why you aren't in that job or why you don't have the bigger salary or why you don't seem to be making progress and maybe aren't advancing. Barb and I got married at the age of 22, and we moved two weeks later to a small church in South Central Kentucky, and even in my vocation as a preacher, ego started to invade. Why wasn't I at a bigger church? Why, why did so many of our friends make so much more money than I did? And the more I thought about those things, the more I became discontented. And I can tell you, within the first four or five years of ministry, there were at least a couple of times that I wanted to find a different vocation and get out of ministry, even though I felt God had called me to ministry. Ego begins taking over, and one can think, I deserve this, or I deserve better. You know, it's often during this stage of life that it's helping to develop your character for the rest of life, because these are when qualities are being developed that will help you later on. Honesty, dependability, loyalty, sensitivity, patience, self-control, enthusiasm, flexibility, persistence, integrity, confidence, forgiveness, punctuality. The man in Jesus' story allowed his accomplishments to become his focus, and he became self-absorbed. 
Now, to those of you in your 20s and 30s, allow your faith to dictate the morals of your character in the workplace. You be the example of arriving to work on time. You work diligently. You don't get lazy. When needed, you go the second mile. When you have an issue with an assignment given you or with a coworker, you take the right steps to remedy the situation. You don't gossip behind somebody's back. You don't sit and complain to other coworkers. You set the example of decency and honesty. You be humble enough to learn how the system works where you are, and if you can't follow it, you help to implement some changes in a gracious way, or you seek another place of employment. I think another temptation that's found in this story that Jesus told about this rich fool that can often affect those in their 20s and 30s is materialism. The first temptation is that of pride, the things we accomplish, but the second one is that of materialism, and I think this is one of the most common, the most subtle, and ultimately can be the most dangerous temptation spiritually for anybody in any age group. But when this phase of 20s and 30s is entered, there's something you get that you've never had before in a much more significant way, and that is purchasing power. You are earning money, and often you're no longer dependent on your parents or others to buy the things you need or want, and there's that certain excitement about buying your first car. There's that excitement about buying or building your first house. I messaged several friends this past week, and I said, do you remember what your very first car was that you bought? Not the one maybe your parents helped you buy. What's the one that you bought? I can remember my dad helped me buy a 1972 Super, Volkswagen Super Beetle. That was my first car. And it was neon orange. You could see me coming a mile away. But the car I bought and paid for myself was my second car, and that was a 1983 Pontiac T-1000. It was the sister car to the Chevette. Do you all remember the Chevette's? Yeah, uh, people had those all over the place. Well, my car was the sister car to it. It's just a touch, a little bit cheaper, and I was able to save up some money and buy that car brand new. Now, in the Old Testament, there is a person who sheds some light on this by looking back at his life and how he messed it up in some areas, and that's Solomon, the son of King David. Solomon tried a lot of different pursuits in his life. He pursued pleasure, he pursued education, he pursued women, but he also pursued materialism and money. Now, Solomon wrote the Old Testament books of Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes was written later in his life when he had the opportunity to look back at his life in retrospect. And in Ecclesiastes 5.10, he says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with her income. This too is meaningless. Sounds a lot like that man in Jesus' story, doesn't it? He is willing to tear down his current barns. He is willing to build bigger ones because of all the possessions he had accumulated. And materialism is often an extension of our ego because we begin to accumulate possessions as status symbols. It's easy to focus on that power of purchasing so much that it can become a way of keeping score of life and a way of proving our self-worth. The American Institute of Certified Public Accountants surveyed just one year ago this month 1,400 millennials about their thoughts regarding money and spending. Three-fourths of them wanted to have the same clothes, the same cars, and the same technological gadgets as their friends, and over one-half of them used a credit card to pay for basic daily necessities such as food and utilities. Over 25% of those 1,400 surveyed had late payments or were already dealing with bill collectors. And so the issues of debt, income, spending, planning for the future financially are huge to this generation, and it's easy for one's focus to be diverted from the spiritual to the financial, and suddenly you leave God out of the equation. Luke 12, 15 in the Living Bible paraphrases, Beware, don't always be wishing for what you don't have, for real life and real living are not related to how rich we are. Now, for those of you that are in your 20s and 30s and you have good jobs and hopefully you are financially prospering, remember that prosperity brings with it a subtle seduction that can erode character and values. It is rare for many in that age range to maintain their spiritual equilibrium and balance when you're becoming successful in the eyes of the world. So be alert to the temptations of pride and materialism. 
Here is a second major principle. Be diligent then in your spiritual priorities. Be diligent in your spiritual priorities. During the decades of 20s and 30s, it's one of the most crucial times for a person spiritually because the pattern you set up during this time is most likely the pattern you're going to ha- live with for the rest of your life. It is a busy time, isn't it, when you're in your 20s and 30s? There are careers and children and a house to take care of, possibly even your parents maybe at the point they're starting to age and they need assistance and you feel stretched very thin. It's a tiring time. You are working. You are running to various events with your children. There are sports and there are school activities, and there are just simply not enough hours in the day to get everything accomplished that you would really like to. And it can be a pressuring time. Some of your contemporaries, some of your friends will want to encourage you to be involved with activities that are not bad, but they just keep filling up your calendar. There are your coworkers, there are your neighbors, there are some of your family members that want you to be involved with something. And it's just hard to cram all of that in, and you have to start prioritizing what is really the most important. The Pew, P-E-W Research Center, follows trends that are shaping our nation religiously. Pew Research says almost 30% of millennials indicate they attend a religious service weekly, and 38% more say they attend about once a month. But of those 30% that say they attend weekly, they say their spiritual involvement and the growth for themselves drastically declines. For example, of that 30% that say they attend weekly, only 18% of those participate in Scripture reading, prayer, or a small group at least once a week, and 60% of those say they never participate in Scripture reading, prayer, or a small group. And these are people who are Christians that were surveyed that said they felt they were actively involved in their church. And so the millennials in our church here in person, where do you fall? How are you prioritizing your spiritual life. Now, so this doesn't come across as a sermon as bashing millennials. We have some great families in our church who are in their 20s and 30s and who are very committed spiritually. In fact, I am impressed by the number of young families in this church. And one of the reasons that I am impressed is because, honestly, those in their 20s and 30s have a lot of options in the church world and could go to a lot of other places, hear a good story, have somebody much younger and closer to them, to their generation, give a good sermon. And my style of preaching is not the most popular kind among millennials. My style is more didactic, more of a teaching style, more of an outline style, more of a deductive approach. And a lot of people in their 20s and 30s are looking for a contemporary story and then maybe a Bible verse or two thrown in to support it, and then some application at the end. Now, I agree totally with the part of application because the Bible always needs to be made so that it can be applicable to our daily living. And let me say this to the millennials. There are some of you who are busy and have young children, and yet you're here regularly, and you're trying to participate. You're trying to contribute in meaningful ways, and you are to be commended. I appreciate the faithfulness of folks like Nick and Brooke Biller, have four young kids, John and Jillian Wright, who have busy lives and teenagers, but they're often, often teaching for us. Scott and Emily Spangler have three children, and number four is going to be here soon, and Samuel won't be outnumbered by his sisters anymore. Will and Charlie Lang and their three children, that family's invested a lot of time, by the way, and energy into our trails and opening our uh, this golf course. Rob and Elizabeth Mitro raising four kids, actively involved with technology ministry here. And there are several other families in that age range of 20s and 30s who are very committed to Christ, raising their children in the Lord, committed to the local church. Uh, Matt and Megan Hayden on our staff. But when I look out across those attending, or I walk back in the gym between services, There's a lot more families in their 20s and 30s, and we are a blessed congregation to have those families because they provide energy, enthusiasm, creativity, and honestly, biological growth as well. (laughs) Nick Biller and I message each other pretty frequently. In fact, Nick and I just have kind of gotten this habit. We'll message almost every day at some point. I'll message him sometime in the evening, and I'll say, are those kiddos in bed yet? And sometimes his response is, yes, thankfully. Sometimes the response is, I'm still lying on the floor in Bryce's bedroom hoping he'll fall asleep. Sometimes it is, I've got one in each arm. I just had one in each arm, and there's a third one at my feet wanting me to pick her up. A few evenings ago, Nick sent me a video where their kids were acting out the story of David and Goliath. 
Now, I'm going to have him pop a picture up here on the screen. It's just a still picture. But here is where Goliath has just been taken down. Uh, there is Bryce portraying Goliath. By the way, he's just been taken down by one of his sisters. <laughs> Now, Nick and Brooke are trying to teach their kids Bible stories by having them act them out. I know uh, Bill and Carolyn Hayes of our church for years have had their children and grandchildren act out the Christmas story on Christmas Eve. One of the grandchildren sitting right here, and he knows that. I'm sure he's played various parts throughout that Christmas Eve story. But for the millennials, there's a huge positive regarding their spirituality, and there is also a challenge. The positive is that millennials want their faith to be active and meaningful. The key word for the millennials in the religious sense is authenticity. They are much more willing to be open about their struggles with their faith than those ahead of them, like, honestly, my own generation. Matthew West has out a great song entitled Truth Be Told that reflects how there are still some who doubt the church can be authentic because they've seen so many in the generations ahead of them live inauthentic lives. It says, there's a sign on the door that says, come as you are, but I doubt it because if we lived like it was true, every Sunday morning pew would be crowded. But didn't you say the church should look more like a hospital, a safe place for the sick, the sinner, and the scarred, and the prodigals like me? Now, we have attending those in their 20s and 30s who had a tremendous spiritual heritage, and you desire to replicate that for your children. But we also have those in that same age range who come with a lot of questions, and they come with a lot of doubts. And wherever you may be on your spiritual journey, I hope you can find a place here that will encourage your going deeper spiritually and to know that despite the flaws of people in every generation, we gather to worship the Lord who is perfect. Now, the challenge for millennials is that it's easy to get distracted spiritually. It is so easy to get distracted spiritually. You're at a period in your life when you're being pulled in so many directions. In fact, Jesus even predicted that this would happen to people that sometimes even fall away from their faith due to being distracted. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells this parable. Some people call it the parable of the sower. Some people call it the parable of the seed. Some people call it the parable of the soils. But it's where the Word of God is considered to be a seed and planted into people's hearts. And Jesus said there are one of four responses. And one of those responses is spiritual distraction. In Matthew 13, 7, it says, Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But then in verse 22, he explains what it is. The seed falling among the thorns refers to somebody who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, making it unfruitful. And the danger you encounter later is that while you might feel like you're being faithful, you can be getting distracted spiritually, and the effect on the next generation, your children, can be devastating. Because the pattern and example you set now affects children for all of their lives and potentially for eternity. I think it's in this period of life, by the way, that Satan doesn't have to do much to entice you. You see, there are a lot of temptations that Satan will put before us, but I don't think Satan has to do a whole lot in, for most any generation. For example, Satan can use doubt and plant it in your mind. A friend asks you, do you think it's necessary to be in worship? Just some doubt. Just making gathering for worship less of a priority until suddenly it becomes not one at all. Satan can use not only doubt, he can use discouragement. You know, when you're in your 20s and 30s and the challenges of raising children, the challenges of juggling time, it is so easy to get discouraged with yourself. It is easy to feel like you're on a spinning wheel that's never going to give up and it feels like you're not accomplishing anything. And maybe you're raising a challenging child, and it gets discouraging, and it's easy to ignore your spiritual life to just address the immediate everyday needs. But I don't think doubt is Satan's biggest tool, and I don't think discouragement is his biggest tool. I think distraction is the best tool he has in his armory. Because when you're in that age range and your work is going well and you get busy and you're earning a decent income and you have resources, it's easier to neglect God, to neglect the church, to neglect the spiritual prodding in your life. And here's the thing, no one ever means it to be that way. It's always a subtle shift. And Jesus said this person begins by seeing their need for the Word of God and then it just slowly gets crowded out by other things. And even in a person's mind, it can seem nothing has changed, but you get to the point you no longer have time for spiritual priorities. So could I be talking to somebody today 
who's allowed your spiritual investments to wane while your financial ones have prospered? Am I speaking to someone today who maybe is saying, well, you know, my family time's important, and so I can for this stage of life. I, I, I think what, what I do with God can come a little bit later because I've got a lot of stuff I need to get done now. Satan doesn't have to do much. Just get you distracted a little bit, and slowly you turn away from God. And honestly, the excitement of being in an in crowd or having more things or more influence or affluence is greater than any spiritual excitement you could foresee in the future. Now, for those families I listed just a few minutes ago who are trying to keep their spiritual equilibrium during a busy phase of life, I can list double the amount I've seen come through these doors and slowly fade away. They've not done anything bad. There's not some heinous sin they've committed in their lives. It's just a slow distraction pulls them away. And honestly, I'm not sure what to say except that Jesus encouraged people to get their spiritual priorities straight. Christianity must be a passionate priority. It cannot be a sideline gig to make yourself look good. It cannot be moderately important to you. Or when worldly success comes, you can wither and die spiritually. Jesus said in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. He goes on to verse 34 and says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know one thing I love about Jesus? He's always so practical. I love what he says there. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Guess what? You don't have to go looking for it, do you? It's going to show up. It's going to come when you get up some mornings. There's no easy way to sugarcoat it. There are just some young adults and older adults too that need to toughen up spiritually. If you get into worrying about life and pursuing wealth and having desires to fulfill your ego, you're going to head down a path that's going to begin to ruin you spiritually. And that is why Jesus said you're to seek God first and His kingdom because there's going to be plenty of worries for the next day. There's going to be the next client you need to meet, the next item you want to purchase, the next trip you want to take, the next level of income you desire, the next level of investment. And the passage we opened up with about the rich man in Luke 12 who worried about having more and then building bigger barns, his priorities totally reversed. He should have been more concerned about his relationship with God. And Jesus said of this man in the story at the end, he said, tonight your life's going to be required of you. You're going to die. A lot of choices in your 20s and 30s. Opportunities are plentiful. Every challenge seems like the dawn of a new horizon. That brings me to the third principle. Be proactive to impact your own faith and that of the next generation. Be proactive to impact your own faith and that of the next generation. Even if you were raised in an atmosphere of faith and church and with godly parents, while they can pass their faith to you, it has to become personal for you at some point. You cannot ride the shirt tails of your parents and grandparents into heaven. Faith is always about personal obedience. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. See, the testing of somebody else's faith does not produce perseverance for you spiritually. It has to be the test of your faith that makes the difference. So here are some suggestions that will hopefully allow you to have the excitement of young adulthood spiritually as well as many other ways and impact your faith and that of your children. Number one, express gratitude and avoid the entitlement mentality. Express gratitude and avoid the entitlement mentality. By the way, this goes back to the issue of pride. But I think every generation deals with the entitlement mentality. I was talking with a member of our church this past week. She happened to be in the building here on, on an errand, and she works in an HR department. And I mentioned about that I was preaching around the, about the millennial generation, and she herself is right at the end of that generation, right around the age of 40. And she commented how many of those in their 20s and 30s that she hires expect the same salaries and benefits of those who've already been working 20 to 40 years. And it is so easy for us to get in that mindset of saying, I deserve or I should have. And we get the focus off self and to get it off of ourself and to live a better connection with God. We have to express thankfulness for what we already have. 
Because that's what I experienced when I was in my early 20s. I wasn't thankful for what God was already doing. And the challenge you might be facing at work in the morning, you get up and remember, Liz, I've got a job today. That project or that boss that may be challenging, remember, you still have a job. Your attitude, your contentment will help provide a much more fulfilling life if you, if, other than just seeing the circumstances around you. That's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Express gratitude and avoid the entitlement mentality. Number two, expect your choices now to affect you later. Expect your choices now to affect you later because how you start your young adulthood is going to be the basis for how you live the rest of your life, and sometimes it's even those choices you make as a teenager. You make the choice of smoking, drinking, overspending, overeating. There are going to be some negative consequences in the future. But in your 20s and 30s, you're bombarded with so many choices that you think one choice in an area really won't affect you that much long term. But later down the road, you discover that one small choice made a huge significant difference in your life two decades later. In that book I mentioned earlier, The Paradox of Choice, Barry Schwartz writes, unfortunately, the proliferation of choice in our life today robs us of the opportunity to decide for ourselves just how important any given decision is. He says every choice is important. Some of them we don't think are, and they really are. Because we might think what's a relatively small decision, a minor decision, that later on it has a huge ripple effect in our lives. The Bible addresses this. There's a spiritual principle from Scripture called the law of sowing and reaping. It's Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And if you're in your 20s and 30s, remember that part of the spiritual law of sowing and reaping is this. You reap in a different season than you sow. You always reap in a different season than you sow. And when you get to my generation, somebody will say, how did you do as a young person? You'll say, well, I sowed my wild oats. person beyond that says, I sowed my wild oats and then I prayed for a crop failure. And that's what ends up happening. We don't realize those small decisions have huge consequences. And number three, experience God in your daily life regularly, not just on an emergency basis. Experience God in your daily life regularly, not just as an emergency or an as-needed basis. Now, depending on how you raised, will often determine how you see God and His involvement. Maybe you were raised where God was rarely mentioned, and so the idea of even a spiritual walk with the Lord is somewhat foreign. But others of you were raised where you saw God displayed in your home regularly. How do you treat your relationship with God? As one with a close friend and you have regular communication and contact? Or do you treat your relationship with God somewhat like a 911 basis and you just call on Him during an emergency? There's a great little book just published last September entitled Back Pocket God, Religion and Spirituality in the Lives of Emerging Adults. Melinda Linquist Denton and Richard Flory researched and they surveyed millennials and discovered that many of them did not see a relationship lived with God lived out among their parents very well. And so as a result of their parents' choices, they have very limited view of God and they're not sure that God can be a part of every day of their life. And so that idea of the book here, Back Pocket God, is that he becomes much like an app on a smartphone. He's accessible, but he's really only called upon when he's needed. And 74% of those respondents surveyed said they believed in God as a being and they believed God is personal but they felt he was completely distant from their lives. That's why I mentioned some of those families' names a few minutes ago. Because there are those who are trying to make God very much a part of their lives and very much a part of their children's lives so the next generation will see the goodness of God. The shortest parable Jesus ever told was about a treasure hidden in a field. Jesus said a man found it, kept it buried, and then he went and sold everything he had to pay for that field because of the buried treasure that was there. And the treasure that was there was the kingdom of God. He found something so valuable 
that all of his other possessions did not matter, and he was willing to give up every possession for that one treasure. How valuable is your walk with God? Because those in your 20s and 30s, the millennial generation has a great opportunity to show and to teach the next generation about Jesus. And you can say with the psalmist, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be reminded of your faithfulness, that we can be reminded of your goodness, and we can see it daily in our lives that you can be very much more than a back pocket God. And so, Lord, as we get ready to look to the cross and to be reminded of what Jesus was willing to do for our salvation, may we each one today review our lives and hearts and see where we need to reprioritize Jesus Christ walking with us daily. No matter what a person's age here today, young, middle age, older, God, may we be very concerned about the choices we make and the ripple effects they will have and how we can live to serve you better and to worship you better and to make an impact in a world that seems to go very wrong at times. And while there can be a lot of good things in this world that we get provided for, may we be cautious to never be distracted from who you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.